Evening, ladies and gents. Uh, my name is Simon Brown. So this evening, we're looking at finding a share, finding quality companies. And I must stress that that when I'm looking for, for companies to buy, I'm looking for stocks that I can hold for, well, I call my long-term portfolio, till death do us part. I want to buy stocks that I hold until I die or until they die, whichever happens first. So that, that's what we're going we're gonna to run through. And, and it, it mostly works, and, and the exits are messy, and I've done some good exits, and I've done some bad exits. Uh, selling SAB in 1998 was a m monumental mistake. Um, but I have a cunning plan. When I sell a stock, I just pretend it no longer exists. So it's like SA who? I've never heard of this SAB. And if you note, check the JSC. There's no SAB. It's gone. Um, so that's going to be the, the, the focus of, of, of the, the presentation this evening. Um, I quickly want to just step back just to position how it all fits. And I'm going to go through this part fairly quickly. We're looking at satellite's core. Your core portfolio is where you have your ETFs, your uh, exchange-traded funds, such as Satrix, such as CoreShares, such as DBX. Uh, that would typically be 50% or more of your portfolio. Why do you have that part there? Because the biggest risk to your portfolio is not Donald Trump, Jacob Zuma, or anybody in between. The biggest risk to your portfolio is me and you. We do stupid things. And then we pretend we never did stupid things. And we carry on holding that dog of a share until it's, and no disrespect, love dogs, but been there, done that. So we have that core of the exchange-traded funds to protect ourselves from ourselves. And I always say, your first 33,000 Rand per year goes into your tax-free investment account. That's nice and simple. Uh, you buy ETFs with your first 33,000. If that's all you're investing, you stop. If you've got more, then you can say, do we go into the individual shares, the satellite stocks, or do we just go more into the, into, into the, 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 the ETF space? Quickly, broadly, we've got value investing, classic value investing, which would be Benjamin Graham, the intelligent investor. Um, I did a scan on the JSC. If you read Intelligent Investor, he gives you his methodology for his two, uh, uh, method for his two ways of finding value stocks. And I did a scan on the JSC a few years ago, and I redid it uh, about the middle of last year. And the number of stocks that came up as a value stock, as per Benjamin Graham, was zero. We do have some value investors. The truth is, everyone's a value investor, right? Everyone's trying to buy cheap and so high. No one's saying, you know, let me buy the expensive stuff except maybe NASPAS shareholders. But hey, don't knock NASPAS shareholders. It's worked for them for 10 years in a row. Um, I'm focusing mostly on the, on the blue chips, the large stocks, some mid caps. The small cap space, I have a bit, but I largely stay away from it. I am looking at long at decades. I'm also focusing, for me, it's on capital appreciation. At some point, the portfolio needs to start paying me so I can live off it, so I can come to Durban permanently and be a surfer. But in the meantime, this is about building the portfolio so that in time, I've got enough capital and I can start generating income from it. And that will then require a shift in the thinking and the process. Um, always cost away. I, I am allergic to fees. I appreciate we need to pay, but I am typically allergic to fees. Um, and that's how it is. So that's how it would look. I own all of those shares on there. Um, your tax-free ETFs and then your individual stocks around the side. And if we delve to that, that's what we're focusing on this evening. My portfolio is 50% ETFs, 30% death to us part, 10% second tier. The distinction between those stocks and those is those I hold with the intention of selling it. You know, they, I, I buy them, they take Tongot. I bought it because there was drought, the property was doing poorly. Uh, what you do know is that drought is followed by rain, unless the world is ending, in which case nothing matters anymore. Um, and property is lumpy. And when property lumps down, you know it's going to lump up. So that's why I got Tongot. In other words, I've bought Tongot, and I expect at some point this year or maybe next year, it'll get to 150, 160, 180, I don't know, and I will sell it and take my money. And some of those holds, Colgrove, for example, I've held now for probably maybe six or seven years. So they might be fairly long term, but they're not what I call death to us part. They are stocks that I'm expecting one day to exit from, take my money and run. And it's a bit light there at the moment. There should be 10 stocks there. And then at the top, I do my trading, my lazy, my allsy, my momentum. In my death to us part, I'm
looking for 10 or 12 shares, 12 at max. Currently, there are 10. There's a space for two more. I'm looking at Bidcorp. That might be one of the ones I add. Um, I only want 10 or 12 stocks. There are 450, 500 shares in the JSC. When I'm looking for new shares, what I actually start with is look to reasons to not invest in them. And as soon as I find a reason not to invest, I move to the next one. Because I want a tiny, tiny fraction of stocks. What you'll also note is that some of the stocks I'm holding there, um, in fact, all of them except for, well, not all of them, uh, famous brands, Metrofile, uh, City Lodge, and Capitec are already in my ETFs. So I'm duplicating. And that's fine. You want to duplicate because what I'm saying is, you know, for example, Capitec, I mean, those, those 10 shares there in my desktop spot, I think they're the best stocks in the JSC. I think they are the 10 head and shoulders best companies. What I then say is, well, cool, I've already got some of my ETF, but I want to add even further to it. I, in a sense, want to go what the lingo, what the, the, the fund managers will say, I want to go overweight. I want to add to those positions and do them bigger because I have conviction for them. I will build the positions over time. I'm constantly buying. Uh, Sassel, I bought my first Sassels at 16 Rand a share. I bought my last Sassels at 414 Rand a share. Um, my first ones I bought in 94. My 414 ones I bought in December. Um, I'm constantly adding to the positions. So we're going to focus on that part, the death drafts part. Um, as I said, so you've got growth, you've got value, you've got income, you've got small and mid. I, I position myself as what I call a GARP present, b, 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 investor, growth at reasonable price. Uh, if you read Phil Fisher, who talks about um, common stocks and uncommon profits, that's vaguely what he's looking at. I'm looking for stocks that give me, as a rule, great growth potential, but I'm looking for non-cyclical, and there's some bugs there, I'll come to those in a second, but I want them at a decent price. As I said, I'm a cheapskate, I'm from KZN, and that's no diss on you people. Um, I'm from the, the hills of KZN, not the Durban of KZN. But uh, it, it, I want them at a good price. You know, I think Capitec's the best stock in the market, but at 760 bucks, it's like, yo, oh, can't do that. Um, Discovery, I think, at 120 is like, absolutely, load me up, get me some more. Woolies at 72, I think, is ridiculous um, in terms of cheapness. I want to buy them cheap which means oftentimes I sit and I wait and I wait because none of the stocks I like are what I consider cheap. I said there was a bug and the bug is quite simple. I said non-cyclical, Billiton and Sassel are cyclical. In truth, they probably shouldn't be in that portfolio. What I mean by cyclical, boom, bust, and more boom and more bust. Sassel is evolving away from that with their ethane cracker plant in Louisiana, where there will be chemical and oil, so they've got both input and output, so as one booms, the other busts, and as one busts, the other booms, and that will remove the cyclical nature of it. Billiton, I haven't bought any Billiton shares since 2007, when oddly enough, I paid 221 Rand, which is probably where it is today, 10 years later. Um, so those sort of don't quite fit into my methodology. Sassel's evolving into it, but Billiton, yeah, Billiton, what can I say? Um, the income, as I said, I will get to in time. The smaller mid-cap is the space where we always rush to. In fact, it's the hardest place. What is a small in the mid-cap stock? Frankly, it's a company waiting to go bust. No disrespect, but most companies go bust. Most small, when I say most, 90 plus percent of small companies don't make five or 10 years. So by buying smaller mid-cap companies, you're buying statistically a company that's waiting to go bust. The trick with it is it's very much understanding the story. It's very much knowing and trusting management and then being able to get a fair read on the financials. But the financials on a smaller mid-cap are not classic financials. You know, they're probably losing money and spending fortunes and, and it's hard to pass say, which is partly why I've got very few stocks there. Uh, and Tongart is really not a small cap. I'm going to add Sea Harvest if I can get allocation for Sea Harvest, particularly if oil. So Sea Harvest will inverse of oil. The more oil goes down, the cheaper diesel gets, the cheaper their costs get, the better it is for Sea Harvest. Um, I almost want to, uh, the big debate I'm having with myself is in the smaller mid cap, shouldn't I hand it over to the experts? Shouldn't I give it to a fund damager to damage for me? 
But you see the problem. If they're going to have the fun damaging it, why don't I have the fun damaging it? I, and, and a good friend of mine, Keith McLachlan, runs a unit trust, uh, and I sit in his investment committee so I can smack him on the knuckles if I think he does poorly um, and berate him if he charges fees, which, of course, he does. That, but that's a separate debate in its entirety. So what am I looking for? Irreplaceable and impenetrable. And I stole that from Shello Giosi, our First Avenue Investment Manager, so I will credit him with it. As I said, I want the best of the best. I don't want semi-good. I don't want okay. I don't want a stock that might one day become. I just want the best of the best. And what I will sometimes do is the stock that sits in my second tier portfolio might get upgraded as it proves itself. And two examples is Capitech and Famous Brands. I bought them in my second tier portfolio because they were doing great and I thought I'll ride this journey. And as they matured and got bigger and better and everything else, uh, they became a stock that qualified to be in my death to us part portfolio. That process took time uh, with Capitec, not so much time. Capitec was probably three or four years. Famous brands probably took close on eight years to gravitate up into the higher portfolio. It's about being selective. It's about saying there are 500 shares and you want 10. So what you're actually doing is you're finding reasons not to buy 490 shares. And those reasons are really, really quite simple. I am completely ruthless. You, you, I mean, you know, management do something stupid. It's like, boom, scratch a list through there. Um, you know, uh, I'm not even going to give examples because that list will go on forever. Um, I don't want cyclicals. I don't want bad sectors. I go to the bottom. Winning stocks in winning sectors. There are entire sectors I just discount. Construction, not interested. Thanks, but construction, so no disrespect to the engineers in the audience because we need you. But back in the day when my father was building the sugar terminals here in the harbor in the, in, in the 60s and 70s, what, what you found with, you know, those skills were, were sought after and hard to transfer. My father worked in Durban. For him to get a job in San Diego was frankly impossible because he didn't know where San Diego was, they didn't know where Durban was, et cetera, et cetera. But now those skills are a commodity and all over the place. You go up to Maputo where they're doing the, 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 the oil and gas explorations, you hear every accent in the world. So what happens with construction? Back in the day, your edge was, well, we're the only company in Durban who can build a sugar mill. Well, oh, boom. But now your competitor is every construction company in the world. So what's your edge from the different construction companies? Well, I'm cheaper than you until you drop your price and I drop my price. And suddenly we're at negative margins. So construction, thanks, cheers. Out the window, not interested into you. Single commodity miners. No, they're not bottom draw stocks. You buy them when the, commod you know, when the commodities are low and you sell them when the commodities are high and you move on to the next one. So there's whole sectors we can get rid of. The sectors you want. So I take it a step further back. What is, I have a key philosophy in terms of my investment thesis, and that is rising consumerism. That is more people globally moving into cities, moving into middle class, earning money, and spending it. We've seen it in South Africa post-94. We've seen it in China to unimaginable levels where literally almost half a billion people have moved from the rural into the city. And when you first move into the city, you don't have much money, you don't have much, but you get a cell phone because now you're in an area which has cell phone reception and you spend a bit of money there and, and then one, you know, and you slowly start building it up. And those consumers come along and they spend. And what do consumers need? Well, at their core, they need food and banking services. So that's a good places to be. And it's finding those places which are going to benefit from this rising consumerization. Commodities did benefit for 10 years up until about 08, but eventually you've built everything you need to build. I mean, how many dams and power stations and, okay, bad example. <laughs> <laughs> how many roads do you need in a place? You know, how many blocks of flats do you actually need? Eventually you've built them all and yeah, I get there's more, but you want to focus into the, that, that particular space. To me, it's about the consumer. It's about the rising consumer who will firstly come into consumerization, middle class, and then ultimately spend their way up it. And they don't, the, the few of them get to LSM 10, that's fine, but they get into the LSMs where they're starting to spend and the like. A significant thing in South Africa um, was social grants. Social grants had a 
fundamental effect on, on two particular industries in this country. One, food, and two, DIY. I mean, I remember driving through the Eastern Cape, I don't know, five years, maybe seven years ago, I can't remember. I um, drove from Durban down to, to uh, Jeffreys Bay. And you drive through the Eastern Cape. And our national flower used to be a plastic bag on a, on a barbed wire fence. No more. Our national flower is a satellite dish. And you are in the most ruralest part of the country, and there are satellite dishes galore. So you say DSTV. Yeah. You say Ellie's. Definitely not. <laughs> winning stocks and winning sectors. Find those winning sectors. Find the winning stocks. Two last points I want to make on that. Firstly, in your winning sector, maximum two shares. If you can't decide who the two best are, if you want to buy three, if you look at the, re at, at the food retailers and you say, I want to buy three food retailers, that means you're indecisive. You can go for two, but you can't go for three. Banks, pick two banks. Ideally, you want to pick one. The only real crossover I have here, I have two, is in food retail, and I have Woolies and ShopRite. That's a conscious decision, right? Because ShopRite is, 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 is everything proof. Because as people get richer, they shop up to ShopRite, and some people go to Woolies, and some come in at the bottom. And then times get tough, and people shop down from Woolies, and they go to ShopRite. I mean, they take their Woolies packet so that no one sees, <laughs> but they, they shop down in a sense. So ShopRite is absolutely bulletproof in that sense, and I'll come to ShopRite in a lot more detail. Whereas Woolies, on the other hand, as we're currently seeing, well, when times get tough, Woolies suffers. Because you know what? They both go to the same place, and they both buy half a cow. Um, and eventually we realized that Willys charges a heck of a lot for their half, whereas ShopRite seems to charge a lot less, and it's all just cow. And I appreciate the stock farmers are saying, no, it's not. It's all just cow. Um, what is our natural inclination, though? What do we do is we hate buying the good stock because we want to get in before everyone else, and we want to get in early, and we want to buy the loser so that when it becomes the... Ah, Winners know how to win. That is so critically important. ShopRite has got 15 years of dominating food retail in this country. Pick and pay stands no chance. Uh, Richard Brasher, who's the new CEO. Well, he's not new anymore. How long has he been here? Three years? So when he got here three years ago, uh, ShopRite's operating margin was 5.6, and pick and pay's operating margin was 1.8. Today, Pick and Pay's operating margin is 1.6. In other words, it's gone backwards, and ShopRite's at 5.6. ShopRite's where it was, and he's done nothing. No, not dissing, well, I suppose I'm dissing Brasher, but you know, it, it, ShopRite has got the experience. They've done it. They know what they're doing. And, and as soon as Pick and Pay tries to come along, ShopRite just takes their operating margin and, frankly, beats them over the head with it. ShopRite is still picking up market share, still has one of the best operating margins for a food retailer on the planet. And I know a lot of that is helped by their Africa expansion. But hey, they went to Africa in 1992, went to the rest of Africa. I remember interviewing Whitey Besson when Walmart was taking a stake in MassMart. And I said to him, I can't call him Whitey, so I call him Mr. Besson. I said, so do you think we can learn some lessons from, from Walmart? And he laughed. I mean, he laughed for like two minutes, which when you're on wireless, doesn't work. It doesn't make for good radio. <laughs> he thought it was the funniest thing ever. And he said to me, young man, I think we're going to teach them some lessons. Well, I mean, Whitey's gone and he won, hey, hands down. I mean, where's Walmart? And, 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 I mean, da, da, ba, 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 no. And the rest of Africa, much like, so if you go back to the 90s, all the South African companies were investing into Australia and America. And pretty much they all came back with a tail between their legs. Discovery lost a billion. Pick and Pay lost a billion with, with Franklin's. I mean, they all came back and said, ooh, it's quite tough out there. And then suddenly we all got excited about Africa. And mostly they're failing as a rule. The best was Woolies. And I love Woolies. But, so they go to Nigeria and they open a store and they notice that it's winter. So they put jerseys. They miss a critical point. It's called an equator. <laughs> it might be winter in Nigeria. All that means is that the days are 29 degrees instead of 39 degrees. Eight months later, they're like, yes, this Nigeria stuff is tough. So they left. Because the Nigerians were like, what is this? You are kidding me. Jersey's never seen it before. Hoy, man, no, man. This is, you know, because as far as they were concerned, it's winter. No, it's not winter. So 
they just get it, and it's about distribution. The reason Shoprite had a knockout year in Nigeria is because most of the of the food retailer shops in Nigeria, the shelves are empty, except Shoprite. Why? Because they've been there 25 years. They've worked it out. They can get the stock to the shelves, and that's what's critically important. Can pick and pay do that? Yeah, sure. Let's talk in 25 years. So we absolutely want the best. And we look at it and we say, why don't we buy choppies, Chap choppies, chappies, choppies, choppies. Why don't we buy choppies because they might become shop right. Yeah, and I might become president of the US. <laughs> okay, that's actually possible. Um, you know, I, I, it, it, yes, choppy, if, if choppies becomes the next shop right, it's going to take them 20 years? Ah, let's say 10. You've got 10 years to buy it. Let's wait until we see some actual evidence that it's starting to happen. And the evidence is, you know, the, yeah, I mean, it, it's just, it's like, no, guys, you, you, what do we do? It's like we go to the race course. Uh, I'm in Durban, so my race course is Gravel. We go to Gravel on Saturday. Ah, you guys do night racing. So we go on Friday evening. There's a race happening. And somehow, 10 meters before the end, we freeze the horses. I don't know how. We do some magic -y stuff. The horses are all frozen, and you can now place your bets. What do you do? You place your bet in like the horse that's first or second, maybe third. You don't go back to the starting store. And you see a horse there and it's like lying down. Maybe it's, maybe it's just sleeping. Ah, but I'm going to put money on this one. Because if it isn't dead, and if it wakes up, and every other horse falls over, and this horse runs in the right direction, man, I'm going to be so rich. Yeah, you will but that horse is dead. Leave it. But that's what our inclination is. We need to get over it. We need to say, you know what? These winning stocks are going to carry on winning. The prices are going to carry on performing. They will, in many cases, mature over time. And, you know, particularly, uh, I'm trying to think. I mean, they're all still, you know, famous brands is now doing fancy pastries in, in, in Melrose and, and burgers in London and Capitex bringing credit cards and home loans and stuff. At some point, you know, they do mature. And then you have to make the call. Metrofile. 100% mature, boring business, and it's why it's in my portfolio. I need some sort of, you know, some stability that, that you know, that, that, that friend at 2 o'clock in the morning, he says, I think that should be your last one. Well, that's metrophile. Um, you need that sort of something in your but That's the call you make. But these companies carry on going. They can grow for ages and, I mean, literally for decades and decades. And we, if you don't catch the beginning, that's fine. We hop on when we do. And if we're going to go and find the horse that might be sleeping or maybe dead, then, then we, you know, we, we're going to more times than not be simply buying the wrong one. Buy the winners. Always buy the winners. So I buy them at the right price, and then I hold them until they die. Or I die, whichever happens first. So far, I haven't died, so I've had a few companies that have died on me, and I'll come back to that in a moment. But then we need to do some fundamentals. So there's three parts to an investment. The first part is the story. The second part is the fundamentals. And the third part is the price. Now, the story is very difficult, highly subjective. I'll come to that in a second. The price is less subjective, but except, I mean, when I say less subjective, I put rules in place, and then I play within those rules. But, of course, I put the rules in place, and my rules are subjective to my thinking. The fundamentals may be less so, although Warren Buffett famously said there are two things you can believe in a set of results, the page number and the dividend amount. Um, but there's... Broadly, three things. So the first is PE, and that gives you an indication of value, and I'll park that because I come to that in a bit. The other two important parts of, the, of a set of results is the cash flow statement and the balance sheet. So we can become CAs and go and, and understand how these work, and we can pull them apart and put them back together. And if you are a CA or a budding CA, then this is something that you will do. I am neither CA nor budding CA, so I don't do that. <clears throat> But I need to look at these numbers. So I do it quite simple. So let's go to cash flow. For me, cash flow is simple. Look at the dividend. What is the single purpose a company exists? 
I know, to pay bonuses and make the world a better place. No, no, no. Company exists for one single reason, to make money for the shareholders. How is that money best reflected? By giving it to me. Don't tell me I did great. Give me a pile of cash. Then you did great. So you check the dividend. Don't tell me your results were brilliant, but the dividend's down 20%. Then your results weren't brilliant. They were horrendous. And I don't look, as always, at an absolute number. I'm looking at the trend. And my example is simple, and I go to African Bank. And I stress this is hindsight, but nonetheless. So for three years before African Bank hit their famous wall, profits were going up. Boom, 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 boom. Dividend went sideways. It's like, hang on, guys. You're making more money... But where is it? Now, in the case of famous brands who cut their dividend, where did it go? Well, it went to England to buy a gourmet Burger King, kitchen, whatever, the burger people. And, and they tell us, we're cutting dividend because we're taking on debt and we're going to, instead of paying you dividend, we're going to pay back the debt and boom. So, okay, that's where my dividend went. Woolies dividend, yeah, modest. And they say, well, you know what, guys, look at our results. Times were tough, so dividend's not brilliant. But hey, it's still there and... What did African banks say? Nothing. They just said, hey, look at our profits. We're making a fortune. No one, it was a magic trick, you know. Look over here. Whereas over there is like no dividend. So I want a dividend that's going up. Short answer, I want a dividend that rises faster than profit. Headline earnings up 10%. Brilliant. Dividend up 15 Now we're talking. You're making cash. Cash is king. So I don't have to go and check the cash flow statement which I find the hardest part of a, of, a, of a set of results to understand. Instead of the cash flow statement, I go look at the dividend. I see what the history is. Is it moving higher? I appreciate that at times, uh, you know, MTN is a bad example, but <clears throat> excuse me, I appreciate at times that dividends are going to stall. In the case of famous brands, the dividend disappeared. As long as you're honest to me and as long as you're upfront and as long as I can see the reason and as long as I understand the reason and am happy with the reason, that's cool. So, Woolies, what's the problem? Well, the problem is twofold. Rich people are shopping at ShopRite uh, with their Woolies packets. Um, and in, in my household, we do it separately. So, my wife shops at ShopRite and I shop at uh, Woolies. We've got to keep both brands going. But also, their little Australian adventures proving a little more challenging. But here's the thing. Mergers and acquisitions take longer than they promise, cost more than they say, and deliver less return. That's just how they work. Uh, I think it was Harvard Business Review did a research on mergers and acquisitions for the S&P 500 over a 20-year period. And they basically said that the S&P would be higher if there had been no mergers and acquisitions. They've, it's too much ego involved, too much ego, too much overpaying, too much we'll have synergies. Well, maybe, perhaps, who, yeah, da, 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 da. So we know why Woolies is, and we, we have to then make that decision do we excuse them? In the case of Woolies, I'm like, cool, you get a pass. I like you. I've also got so many shares, I'm going to get invited to the board meetings, which I figure they have chuckles. I'm really excited. I love chuckles. And they are damn expensive. So that's my cash flow. Then I need to understand my balance sheet. Now, balance sheet's got two parts to it. And the one part is assets, good things, pay you money. Other part, liabilities, bad things, cost you money. And they don't add up, so the chartered accountants stick a number under the one side, and now they balance, and they say boom, boom. But basically, if you took all your assets and liquidated them and took all your liabilities and paid them, you've got a pile of cash left. That's called a net asset value. That is the breakup value of the business. If you liquidated that business today, that's the pile of cash you'd have left over. Now, the business trades above that net asset value because you're not buying a listed company for the breakup value. You're buying it for the future profits. But what I want to see with my net asset value is I want to see it moving higher. If my net asset value, and what they will do is they will do it net asset value per share. I want to see that net asset value per share increase. And as long as it's ticking up, I've got a decent looking balance sheet. That's not getting stressed. If suddenly my net asset value starts to like mm, dive off the cliff, I'm like, whoa, there's problems in the balance sheet. I've got to go and dig around and find out what the problems are. Or I can cheat and I could tweet Keith McLachlan or Corin Richards and ask them to dig around. Uh, although Corin wouldn't do balance sheets, he would do charts. But there's, there's something wrong and I need to go and have a look-see. So those are the dividend and the net asset value. 
are the two things that I keep track of. But I find a new company I'm interested in. I want to go get historic data. And when I'm invested in a company, they're the first numbers I check when results come out. When I'm looking backwards, I look at seven years of data. There's a reason for that. Adrian Seville, Canon Asset Managers, uh, he crunched the numbers and they determined that the best period on the JSC is seven years. If you do less than seven years, you haven't got enough information. And if you do more than seven years, you don't get any increase in reliability of the information. So they say, in the JSC environment, look back over a seven year period and you've got a fairly decent indication of what the story is. So I go back and I look over the seven years and I get my two pieces of information. So that's my really, really basic fundamentals, and I stress the really, really basic part. Um, the key point is the impenetrable and irreplaceable, and how do we get to that? And this is Porter's Fire Forces, and I've spoken about it often. Uh, it comes from a management textbook in the 80s. Don't read the book. It's totally terrible. But he did. So it was actually a strategy book on, on business strategy. But what he's talking to and what he's talking about is how do you define and, 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 and find great businesses. And there's a bunch of things. Um, and the first in the middle is competitive rivalry within an industry. Intuitively, you say, oh, let's invest in an industry where there's no rivalry, no competition. No, oh, that's horrible. Because for a while, you're in an industry with no competition. But if you're making chunky profit, someone's going to notice. And that person who notices is going to come and compete with you and probably try and undercut your price. So you actually want competitive industries. You want hugely competitive industries. And let's look at some of our competitive industries. Let's look at food retailing. I mean, Walmart has tried and failed. But do you want to open a new food retailer in South Africa? No. Let's look at banking. Do you want to open a new bank, you know, branch network in South Africa? Now, Discovery thinks they do, but Discovery is a different kettle of fish entirely. You want that competition within an industry. Competition is really, really good because it keeps people away. And that's actually a good thing. So you want the competitive environment there. Bargaining power of suppliers. Frankly, you want suppliers to have no bargaining power as far as possible. And that's what ShopRite has. So, of course, YT is no longer there. Peter Engelbach, is that the new chappie? Uh, whatever. So he has complete bargaining power, doesn't he? Because he wants a million tins of baked beans. He wants them delivered on Wednesday at 12 minutes past two. He wants them delivered at that price. Oh, and he will pay you in four months' time. And if you don't like it, that's cool. Because you know what? Someone else makes baked beans. And if you have a great new product that you want to sell via ShopRite, not only do you have to go through the entire process and get selected, if at the end they do like your product, they charge you rent. Thousands of rands per meter of shelf space. You want to sell your product? You pay ShopRite to sell your product at ShopRite. He has total supplier control. Now, in truth, Pick and Pay does to a large degree. So does Spa. Choppies to obviously a much smaller degree. But that's the point. Choppies goes and they only want to buy 10,000 tins of baked beans. And they don't have a central distribution. So can you please deliver it to... 48 stalls, 20 in KZN, 12 in the Platinum Belt, and then we've got some in Zimbabwe. And already I can see you baked bean manufacturers saying, hey, no, bring me ShopRite, right, man, bring me ShopRite. Right. You will get a better price with Choppies, sure. But then the customer knows that too. So you want the industries where the bargaining power of the suppliers is fairly weak. That's the ideal place to be. Banks. Hands up who loves their bank. Okay. Hands up who changed their bank in the last year. Okay. Hands up who's in an abusive relationship with their bank. <laughs> Get the point? Everyone has a bank account. No, I lie. We have multiple bank accounts. We have a current account, maybe a savings account. We probably have an overdraft facility, maybe a credit card, a home loan, a vehicle finance. I'm on six and you've got a stockbroker. I'm on seven. No one likes them. What do you know when your bank account statement arrives every month? There's something called fees. Fees is English for, we're ripping you off. What do we do about it? We pay the fees. Banks are central to how things work. So, 
back to the back, off track there. Bargaining power suppliers. You want it. The suppliers have very, very weak bargaining power. If we then go to bargaining power of customers, we have perfect bargaining power with our banks until you try and change a bank account and you discover it is like the hardest thing in the world. And changing the account is not hard. So I changed an account 10 years ago from one bank to another. Eventually, I had to cancel the service because they couldn't stop debiting the old bank and debit the new bank. And eventually, I just said to them, you know what? And they just they went away eventually because they got they, they would try and debit my old account and it was closed and then they would phone me and it eventually it was like I just stopped answering the phone and eventually they stopped phoning and they just lost a customer. It was fine. It was a gym membership. <laughs> um, for KZN and I now lived in Joburg. But anyway, we can, but we don't. But you want so so a shoprite customer. We have perfect bargaining power in a sense. So we can't go to ShopRite and say, we don't like the cost of these. These, these baked beans are too expensive. We want a better price. They're going to be like, <laughs> <laughs> they, the customer has the power in that relationship. So what do the retailers do? Well, partly it's about location. Be in the right place, and that's why we just see stores popping up all over the place to 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 accommodate. Um, you know, I live in Joburg. I've got five Woolies I could walk to in ten minutes. I mean, two things. Firstly, we don't walk in Joburg, and secondly, it takes twenty minutes to drive because of the traffic. But there are five of them. Why? So there's always a Woolies close to you wherever you live in Joburg, and and you'll see the same with the shop rights, and they cannibalise each other. But they always want to be there. They need, but the big thing with it is its brand perception. In the mind of the sh consumer, ShopRite Checkers owns the perception of cheap shopping. Not badge, not, not low quality, just low price. And that didn't happen overnight. And it is pick and pay's biggest problem. How do they change that perception? So pick and pay do brand match. Pick and pay do smart shopper card. Smart shopper card is the worst thing in the world, right? So occasionally I go to a pick and pay. Technically it's banned in my household, but occasionally I'm there. What's the first thing they say to me? Are you a smart shopper? I have to say no. <laughs> brand match, smart shopper. Apparently, they have data on millions of people. Apparently, they've given billions of rands back. Nice, but I don't see it in their results. I don't see it in them getting market share. I don't see it in their operating margins improving. I don't see it in their sell-through rates. I don't see it in their comp stores, like-for-like like ex-inflation sales. I'm not seeing it where it matters most. So, yes, smart shopper is lacquer. Brand match, I, I'm not even sure I understand what brand match is. I'm sure it's lacquer too. But in the mind of the consumer, cheap, shop right. Not cheap and nasty, cheap and good, shop right and checkers. And that is immensely hard. Woolies, in the mind of the consumer, quality. Now, the problem Woolies has is quality and expensive. And they're trying to change that expensive part. And when you pay 60 bucks for a packet of chuckles, it's never going to work. But they, need, but they do have the quality. And that works. So a quick story. And some of you would have heard the story before. My sister, all five feet two of her, scariest person in the world, buys a lamb's wool jersey from Woolies, and the label says, hand wash only. She throws it in the washing machine. It comes out destroyed. So she takes it to Woolies. And, and I happen to be in Durban, and she says, do you want to come? I'm like, yeah, because Woolies are going to whip you. She takes it to Woolies, and she says to the lady behind the counter, I bought this jersey. It said hand wash only. I washed it in the washing machine. Look what happened. It's destroyed. And I'm like, ho, ho, whipping coming. The Woolies lady says, what color would you like the replacement? I'm like, no, but you don't understand. She messed up. She admits she messed up. You just send her on her way. And the Woolies lady said, no, no, we'll replace it. It's her fault. But you know what? We like our customers. My sister shops at Woolies. Technically, she's not on the right LSM, but she shops there because she knows that even when she messes up, they will see her right. I got a buddy who left two liters of milk in the boot of his car in the heat wave in January of last year in Joburg. 
it went sour. He went to Willie's and said, your milk is sour. Willie's is like, cool, he has four liters because, hey, sorry for you. You shop there because you know it's quality. You know it's brands. The old folks in the audience will remember the kids' underwear of the 70s. I think it was called Princess, but it was weird because it was boys' underwear too. <laughs> Maybe I'm getting part of the story wrong. The point is I know my grandmother used to buy it for me. And the only reason I'm not still wearing it is because I grew bigger. Because, man, those things are still somewhere out there and they are perfectly fine. Because they were quality, man. They were bulletproof. And called princess. I, the, the story doesn't gel, but you get the picture. How do you compete against that? How do you start to brand and get that level of trust? You can. Quickly. So as I said, the big challenge for Woolies is how do they get rid of the expensive tag? Because even though they say you can eat for four people for 100 rand, you ask anyone, Willies, yeah, whoo, man, expensive. You know that car? I mean, one half of the car went to ShopRite, one half went to Willies. ShopRite put a piece of plastic on it and sell it to you for X. Willies put three pieces of plastic, a pretty picture, a story, and sell it to you for four times X. It's a cow. But hey, I shop at Willies. And we, so the problem is the customer. So let's go to telcos. Porting is the easiest thing in the world these days. I've ported, I once ported in 2010, I ported four times in, 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 in six months, eight months. I tried every network for two months and then picked the best one, which was Cell C because my phone never rang because there was no reception. Um, <laughs> but my, my people objected. Apparently, I need to be contactable. Um, and it worked perfectly well. And I know sometimes porting doesn't. But the truth is, the reason, I mean, wh why don't we port? You know why? Because they've made it so damn confusing that we can't tell who's cheap. There's no apples and oranges. And we're not comparing apples with apples there. There we are comparing apples with nuclear warheads, man. And it's just like we don't know what's happening here. And that is intentional and purposeful. So you don't know if there's a better deal. So there's a price war on at the moment between Cell C and Telcom. So I think to myself, you know what? I'm a smart man. I can sit down on my Sunday morning and I can work out who's better. How hard can this be? Yay, boy. I mean, I had spreadsheets. I had pieces of paper printed out with markings on them. At the end of the day, I'm staying with MTN because I can't work it out. So they get you by complexity. Threat of new entrants. So sometimes you're ring-fenced by legislative. Banks, you need license. Telcos, you need license. Sometimes you're ring-fenced by the competitiveness of the industry. Sometimes you're ring-fenced by the strength of the brands you want to compete with. But sometimes also, the new entrants are disruptors, but in subtle ways. So we think disruptor, right? What do we think? We think Uber, we think uh, Airbnb, we, uh, we think those. But for every Uber and for every Airbnb, there are thousands of failures behind them. The disruptors you want are the ones that come along and are in the industry and just do a little tweak. The best disruptor we have in our market is Capitec. What was Capitec's disruption? Well, the reason they were able to disrupt is because they only launched their, their bank in the late 90s, 20 years ago. The big four banks all run around telling you that they're 150 years old and that is great news. The problem with being 150 years old, it means somewhere there's a piece of paper that's 150 years old and you've got to go find it. Capitec is 100% electronic, 100% centralized, and that's half of their disruption. The other part of their disruption is you can have a Capitec bank account for five rand 60. And the bigger part of their disruption is they go where their customers are and they're open the hours the customers are there. None of this, we're a bank, so we close at 2 o'clock on Wednesday. Do banks still close at lunchtime on Wednesday? Don't they? Okay. So at least they got that right. There's a Capitec down the road for me that happens to be, it's in Louis Bourton, and it happens to be on a major taxi rank. So it opens at 5.30 in the morning and closes at 8 o'clock at night. You know why? Because their customers are there at 5.30 in the morning. If they opened at 9 o'clock and closed at 4 o'clock, they wouldn't have a customer. In truth, they could close between nine and four. They said, you know what? Instead of saying to the customer, sorry, man, we'd keep these hours and uh, they say to the customer, okay, well, you are uh, here. Look, we see that you're here. Let's, let's be here. 
and let's be open and let's give you, that's their disruption. Simple. Discovery is disruption. They're just selling you medical aid. But they do two clever things. Damn right, it's expensive. It's very expensive. Here's a top tip, peeps. Don't own Discovery Medical Aid. Own Discovery Shares. Actually, no, you all own Discovery Medical Aid. I'll own Discovery Shares. <laughs> so what do they do? The first trick is, typically, as an insurer, what do you do? So you take all white men aged between 35 and 55, and you say, you folks are all the same. No, we're not. I smoke and drink more than probably all of them put together. I should be a different, but now discovery can do a couple of things. Firstly, it nudges you. It says, you know what, if you go to gym, you'll discount the gym and we'll give you a smoothie. I'm like, yeah, look, I don't like smoothies and I wasn't going to gym anyway, so it doesn't count. But if you run around the block, you'll get a this and you'll discount your Apple Watch. What do I want an Apple Watch for? I've got a, f uh, but it's working. Vitality is working. What vitality does is it means that discovery clients are typically healthier. And as an insurer, manna from heaven. Oh, but now they're getting way smarter. Vitality was the first part of the equation. Now they've got a watch on your arm that they can track. Pretty, they, if they insure your car, they've got a little monetary thing in your motor car. They're going to give you a credit card. See, here's Friday evening, right? You finish work. They notice that you uh, drive a small distance down to a place where they happen to know there's a regular hangout and a sale of alcohol. They don't have any opinion of that. You're welcome to have your alcohol. They notice your credit card getting hit with increasing frequency and cost at the place where you're drinking your alcohol. They see the two o'clock withdrawal outside the famous brands later that evening. And they watch your car stagger its way into an accident and they reject the claim. They're like, don't be stupid. We know who you were, where you were. All we don't know is what music you were listening to. That's their disruption. Their disruption, instead of seeing, as insurers have typically done, is white man, 35 to 50, boom, we know who you are. They now say, Simon, we see you. And I'm like, no, you don't. I'm not in your books, guys. I go somewhere where it's cheap. But that's what they're doing. They're going down to the individuals. And they are nudging you to be better. Because when you drive badly and you suddenly break, they send you an SMS and they say, oh, we saw you suddenly break. Are you in an accident? It sounds caring, hey. You know what they just did? No, you know what they just did? They just said, we're watching. You didn't realize how close we are, but we are watching. And suddenly, my buddy, who used to drive like a maniac, man, he drives like a 92-year-old granny. <laughs> I said, dude, you realize the speed limit's 100. You can go faster. No, 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 no. Discovery's out there. I don't know where they are. <laughs> so they've got a 26-year-old crazy man in Cape Town driving down the freeway below the speed limit because he knows that Discovery's watching. That is disruption. That is what you want in terms of disruption. Substitute products is real. Substitute products will catch you blindsided every single time. Substitute products is a terrible thing because it just comes at you, boom, and you never saw it coming. But you got so the best example is there was a company called Awa. They used to make answering machines. You young kids have no idea what I'm talking about. It was a giant thing. It had a tape in it. You young kids don't know what a tape is and a blinking light. And it would physically, you would record a message onto it, people would phone, and they would record their message onto your tape, and you would come home and see a blinking light and push play. And in the 1980s, they were doing a billion dollars a year selling answering machines, and they are gone. Why? Because, well, firstly, because every, I mean, we just have everything has answering machines, but they exist in the cloud. But there's a bigger disruption that happened. You notice what cell phones did? Cell phones killed talking on telephones. It's the weirdest thing. But we no longer talk on our telephones. That's like so, like 2005. We WhatsApp. We message. So cell phones used to make, telcos used to make a fortune of SMS. And in truth, voice. We don't call and we don't SMS because we've got data. We WhatsApp. I WhatsApp my sister. She goes to Bangladesh. I phone her via WhatsApp. She's in a hotel room on free Wi-Fi. I'm at home on free Wi-Fi. Boom, free phone call to Bangladesh. A phone call that just 10 years ago would have cost 10, 15, 20 rand a minute. Foop, it's free. 
So disruption comes, and we will see it too late. That's fine. If you're on the disruptor, that's brilliant. But if you're getting side curved, we're never going to get it perfectly timed. We need to, there's one that isn't there, which is legislative risk. Legislative risk, Aspen published their results this morning, and the line which I've been waiting a decade to see, I love you, Aspen, because finally it is there, legislative price decreases. In English, governments are making us stop, rip you off. We know drug, drug not even drug companies, the medical industry is... You know, massively expensive, increases ahead of inflation since, uh, since, since they invented drug companies. And finally, governments are saying, hey, guys. So Life Healthcare bought a business in Poland, paid however many hundreds of millions for it. And just after they bought it, the Polish government said, you know that price that you're charging? You can't. You're going to charge a price that is approximately 75% lower. You know what? You're still going to make a profit. You're just not going to gouge a profit. That is the future of medicine and hot, uh, not hotels, um, hospitals, drug companies, that is their future. We've seen it locally already, single exit pricing. We see Donald Trump talking about it. You don't find a politician who says, yeah, these drug companies charge a great fair price. Two or one, they say, hey, there's, do you want to be owning a company that is having the governments around the world beat you over the head to make less obscene profits? No. So legislative risk is real. We need to run our companies through this. And I end up with something that looks vaguely like that. So here's Capitech. There's my run. Substitute products, cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, maybe something like that. Uh, cashless, I can't really think. So substitute product for Capitech, I mean, I don't know what it is. I mean, I honestly don't. I mean, maybe it is a cryptocurrency, and that would really disintermediate them. Cashless society, well, frankly, we're all almost already there. You know, you know, we don't you know, we don't need cash. We've got plastic. Plastic works just as well. In fact, plastic has almost been disintermediated. We've got apps on our phone. Someone paid me the other day. Literally, it's just like zip, zip, zip. We've got money in your account. I'm like, you don't know who I am. Oh, no. Uh, Geo proximity thingy majiggy. I don't know. And I went to an ATM and I had 100 rand. It was bizarre. It was quite nice. It was 100 rand. But... So I don't know what their substitute potential threat is. But that's the point. Oftentimes, we don't. New entrants, sure. Could we have a new entrant into the low cost, into the into, into the banking space? Well, well, we've got discovery coming. Um, we absolutely could. It's not easy. It's taking discovery years and years and years to go through the process, and it's going to cost them a billion rand or whatever it's going to be. There is certainly that possibility, but that it's going to have to be a new entrant. One of the legacy banks is not it. So you've got to keep an eye out. I suspect, however, that discovery probably goes over after a slightly different market to Capitec. Yeah, the discovery client is not driving down Louis Boiter at 5.30 in the morning. Customer power? Absolutely. We have it. <clears throat> we don't use it. But in truth, customer power plays into Capitech's hands. Because if you're leaving your bank, I mean, why are you leaving Capitech? Because you like fees? No. Supplier power? Uh, they don't really have suppliers. Uh, they're, they're banking. I mean, yes, IT and stuff, but not... not Competitive industry, you betcha. And legislative risks, yeah, sure. Uh, Basel III coming through, which increases uh, uh, amounts they've got a hold on their balance sheet. Um, National Credit Act, uh, Consumer Protection Act, all of these sort of things have hindered Capitec. In truth, they've made Capitec a better bank, maybe a less profitable one, better, better bank in many senses. So what I ultimately want is I want the three reasons why I love the stock. Capitec is simple. Cost to company. So Capitec have a sorry, uh, cost to consumer. Let me go to cost, cost to income. Cost to income ratio. For every rand they receive, what percentage goes to costs? Capitec, 35. Big banks, 55. Boom. They just make 20 cents more per rand. The Capitec number will increase. The big bank number, they all tell you it will come down. It hasn't in 10 years, so I'm not sure when it's coming down, but don't hold your breath. You will turn blue. So these are the three things I look for. When they start to change, and then on my other side here is bad debts. I, big banks is this. I drew this list up in 2007, and it's remained, 
at the time, I kept on thinking the big banks are going to come for capital. Surely they're going to come for capital. They have. I mean, I know, yes, they do. They try, and they still say, yeah, no, look, we don't open on Sundays, and on Saturdays we close at 11. We do work Wednesday afternoons now, but only until 4, and we're not going anywhere going to put a branch in a taxi rent. Come on. So the big banks hasn't come. Bad debts is the worry. But Capitec manage their bad debts. Infinitely better than African Bank. Why are those important? Because I need my trigger to know when to sell. When those start to weak, so when those start to rise their horrible heads, or when those good things start to go down, it's time to bail. Shop right. Substitute products? No, we need to eat. We could buy somewhere else. That is a real threat. Pick and pay could start to get it right one day, and ShopRite could start to get it wrong. That's not impossible. We look for that in things such as operating margin and market share. New entrants, sure, but hard. I mean, Choppies is, is, is really, really struggling. Uh, Walmart is absolutely nowhere. Brasher, uh, he spins a great story, but I'm not seeing it in the numbers. Customer power, yeah, we have total power where to shop, but they have brand and they have location and they have perception. Uh, supplier power, zero. Competitive industry, absolutely love it. Legislative risks, none really. So ShopRite, margins, Africa, low cost, low LSM. Threat, uh, competition one day, perhaps. They start to lose their plot, not impossible. So that's my process. I start with the story. And I have I, I, I use pieces of paper, and it takes it take me weeks, if not months. I'm busy going through it with Bidcorp. And I do that story. I run through that Porter's Five Forces. I look at what's good, what's bad, what's ugly. I start to build that story. I build my lists up, and then I come down to the three key reasons I love the stock. And those three key reasons, more than anything, are actually my exit signal. Quickly go back to SAB Miller. The reason I loved SAB Miller was not because I liked their beer or anything, but because you could buy an SAB Miller anywhere in this country. Have you ever walked into a liquor establishment and said Castle and they've said, sorry, no stock? Never happened, never going to happen. I bought SAB, one of the biggest reasons was their distribution network. And then they started going global. And I'm like, whoa, hang on, guys. You deliver beer in South Africa. I've never seen you deliver a beer in America. I don't know if you can do it. So I bailed. I was wrong. But uh, you're right, you're wrong sometimes. The point being is, know what they are. Know why you bought it. Know what to test them against. And then, again, of course, regularly, cash, net asset value. And then comes price to pay. So there are two schools of thought in price to pay. The first school of thought says, buy it. Price be damned. Yeah, that's fine if you get it right. It's scary if you get it wrong. I like to pretend I can get some value going. So I want to do a chart. I'd get seven years of data, and I chart the P-E ratio, price earnings. I get a chart that looks like that. There's my chart for Willie's updated on Tuesday. So that is seven years. You'll note all I do is I actually just get the PE every six months as results come out. So I get 14 pieces of data rather than 1,400 pieces of data. Um, my average is the red line, and I want to buy when the forward PE is below the red line. Here's the math. So there's Willie's. This is screenshot for close on Monday. I'm prepared to buy Woolies up to 91.95. I'm going to come back to that in a moment. Let's park that for a second. How did I get to 91.95? Average PE, which is that red line, divided by forward PE, which I get from my stockbroker, multiplied by current price. Woolies, average 18.9, forward 14.8, share price 72.01, boom, 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 91 rand, 95. Now, a year ago, that number was 85 Rand. So I spent all of last year buying Woolies below 85 Rand. I bought 84, I bought 82, I bought 77, I bought 74, I bought 69, and finally in December, I bought some at 62. That's why I'm getting a board seat, man. I've been buying Woolies. <clears throat> so the important point is what I'm saying is I want to buy below 91.95. There are a couple of critically important things. I'm not saying it can't go lower. It has. 
I'm just saying that to me is the value I want to pay. That 91.95 will change. As new results come out, it will go up or down. As expectations, because there are two moving parts here. Well, there are three. Current price, yeah. But those moving averages will change as we move forward. That is not a foolproof number. I bought uh, Sassel at 414, 424, because my system said that's a good price. And now it's 360, so I'll just buy more. What it's saying to me is below this price, I like it. What happens is at the moment, and let's go to that slide there. So my entire portfolio is at, at the website there. And if you follow the link, you will find all of the pricing. So I put these up on, my, on, on a Google Excel, on a Google spreadsheet. Of course, I only do the 10 stocks I own. So the rest aren't there. But you'll note that a lot of them are actually currently in the price zone where I'm happy to buy them. Two years ago, I was buying practically nothing except Capitec. Because Capitec was 200 bucks, my system was saying that's a good price. But then everything, but, so the market goes. When the market's booming and going higher, I'm just collecting cash. And then what happens, market goes down, or the stocks go down, now they come into my buy zone. Now I'm interested. And I buy what's currently available. Right now, I'm no longer buying Woolies. Why? Because frankly, I have too much. I'm also no longer buying Sassel because I have too much. So I'm buying Discovery, I'm buying City Lodge, I'm buying, actually I need to update my Metro file, my Metro file is not updated. Um, I'm buying some shop rights uh, and I'm buying some famous brands because they are low weightings in my portfolio and they are in my buy zones. I don't buy aggressively, I buy a bit and I come back in a few days or a week and I check and I buy some more and it's a process to build it. The Calcs are there. And if you go to my page, you'll find a link to, there's a 40-minute video on the valuation. I went over it quickly to get the pricing. Um, but because there, there's an entire video there, so you can go delve into it. And I don't need to check my time because I'm hitting time. I want to end with two key points. Almost everything I say this evening is subjective. Almost everything I said this evening, someone could make a compelling argument to make me look like a fool. That is investing. Of course it is. If it wasn't subjective, if investing was 100% objective and we could quantifiably say this is the answer, none of us would be here because there would be no market. That disagreement is what makes the market, is what makes the opportunity. It also makes it as scary as heck. We've got to have that courage of our conviction. And part of that courage of the conviction is that if you disagree with me, that's fine. If you disagree on something, you know, on, on a theory, if you disagree on a price or something, that's absolutely perfect. The key point is to have a process, to have a process, and to have a process that results in you buying the best companies in the best sectors. That's my process. Yours, you can take it and use it exactly. You can completely do something different. But you need a process that gets you to own the best stocks and the best sectors. That's all investing is. Buy them at prices that are nice. Come back in 10, 20, 40 years' time. Always know why you bought it. Because then you know when to sell. And to say that Jean-Pierre Fester said it's a good stock is not a reason to buy it. No, because with no disrespect to Jean-Pierre Fester, he doesn't come back in six months and tell you it's a bad stock. Know why you bought it. Ladies and gents, I've hit my time, so I'm going to park it there. If there are questions, chat to me afterwards. Thank you very, very much for your time this evening. 